So good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to greet you today for the opening day of Jennifer Steinkamp Blind Eye. And we are incredibly fortunate to have Jennifer here with us from Los Angeles. So um, our, I'd just like to remind you that the exhibition um, will be open until October 8th. And it really does require return visits. I'm not just saying that. Um, and I want to just introduce Jennifer. Um, before we get started with her incredible um, presentation of her career. Jennifer Steinkamp is one of the leading installation and new media artists working today. She was born in Denver and raised in Edina, Minnesota, near Minneapolis. Edina. I've never been there. Um, you, you, can, you can tell us about, about that later. Near Minneapolis. Oh, no. Okay. Um, she attended the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia as a motion graphics major. In 1984, she saw an avant-garde computer animation by John Whitney Sr., and she dropped out of school to begin working in special effects. She found a job at a graphics and animation firm where she first gained access to expensive computers and software. The following year, she moved to New York and spent two years animating television commercials for Fujifilm, Timex watches, and bug spray. And she said of that time, I read this on the internet so it must be true, I animated the little cockroaches in the spray can. <laughs> she would return to California in 1989 and earn her Bachelor of Fine Arts and Design in Fine Art, graduating with high honors from the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Two years later, she earned a Master's of Fine Arts, and she has taught design and media arts at the Art Center College and UCLA, and she is known for being a generous teacher and mentor to many. She's had many solo shows in the United States, including the Portland Art Museum, I'm just naming a few, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Corcoran, the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, and most recently along the Benjamin Franklin Parkway in Philadelphia, a project which she will talk to us about today. Her work can be found in the collections of international museums and private collections, of course, but museums including the Detroit Institute of Art, the Busan Museum of Contemporary Art in Korea, the Hammer Art Museum, and LACMA. She is represented by Lehman Maupin in New York and Hong Kong and Green Grassy in London. And her projections have been featured in many biennials and festivals, including the Taipei Biennial in 2006 and the 8th Istanbul Biennial in 2003. And in the most recent weeks and months, she has been working on new projects for Shanghai, Los Angeles, and Kansas City. She never stops working. And as Christopher Knight wrote in the LA Times, Jennifer Steinkamp is one of the most consistently inventive artists working today. So when I first came across Jennifer's work, I was greatly impacted by the completely meditative quality of her installations. She encourages her viewers to become lost in her hypnotic, looping images that are on face value quite beautiful and painterly though her chosen medium couldn't be farther from paint. Her installations are complicated in their methods of creation and in the demands they require from us. They are laced with tension, melancholy, and wonder. And to put it simply, they require, or they elicit a complex um, reaction, which is what I believe good art should do. In many ways, Jennifer Steinkamp, Blind Eye, our exhibition, is the perfect counterpart to the exhibition of women artists in Paris, 1850 to 1900, because like those painters working in the 19th century who overcame intense obstacles, constantly pushing the boundaries of the art establishment, Jennifer too is constantly redefining meanings of art, new media, and technology. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer Steinkamp. And we're gonna dim the lights so that we can better see um, a sampling of Jennifer's work. And we're gonna just talk about your career. You've brought some slides, um, some kind of important works along the way. And I'm, I might interrupt you every once in a while to ask you some questions if you don't mind. Okay, that's working. Well, thank you for coming. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> then how did you hear me say that? <laughs> All right, there we go. Yeah, that's different. Okay, well, I'm just gonna start. Do I have to talk like that? Oh. <laughs> wow. 
All right. Oops. Okay. Uh, this is the first installation. It was at a museum in um, Santa Monica, California, and a house in Pasadena. The same piece projected at the same time. And it's, I called it gender specific, and it was about splitting the architecture into a male and female half. And so the male side is the exterior, and the female half is the interior. interior. This was a Frank Gehry building uh, that I added uh, stainless steel and fleur de lis to because I was a bad girl. Can I, can I ask you? Um, so, art historians and critics have often um, said about your work that you're interested in gender and identity, and this is one of his mm -hmm. kind of literal example, but does that hold true? Oh, till absolutely, now? yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, I, uh, a lot of the motion comes from my identity as a woman and maybe uh, the sensuality that I uh, associate myself with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. This piece uh, was untitled at the time, and it made me realize I could dematerialize architecture with light. And light has no physicality, so to me that was kind of amazing that you would get a physical sensation from something that has no materiality. And so you'd, people actually felt seasick, and that, that was uh, kind of a you know, great discovery. So let me ask you just a really basic question for our audience. Um, can you tell us about your, your tools, how you create mm, these, these yeah. pieces? Because I think it's, it might be complicated for, for some of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do I begin? Um, I, I use 3D computer software. Um, it's the same software that's used in Hollywood for like Pixar films and things like that. So, but I don't do Incredibles or, um, I, I, everything I make is in the so in using the software, uh, paint textures in Photoshop and then apply them to 3D forms that I model. So does that help? Yeah. And then I, um, animate those forms using different tools, like there's things to uh, add dynamics, which adds kind of like wind and uh, randomness. Like maybe your, this will give you an idea. What does your studio look like? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, it looks like an office. It's actually a bedroom converted into an office then with um, a projection on one wall. So in this piece, it's called Swell, and this is the first time a museum bought a piece, so it was quite amazing for me. Um, there's a frontal projection and a rear projection. So um, somebody standing behind the vertical uh, will be seen, you know, their shadow will be seen, but their body won't be seen. So I have a question that I think fits really well with this, this slide mm -hmm. in particular. So I have read your installations um, be described as immersive landscapes that exist somewhere between science fiction and a mushroom trip. <laughs> and I'm wondering if that's the type of experience. You it's know, a good thing I've done mushrooms, so, <laughs> so, so, so I can know. actually answer the okay. question. But is this way, are you trying to disorient your viewer some, occasionally in a, mm. in a piece like this? Well, what I discovered with the untitled food house piece, the one on the floor, um, is architecture can be dematerialized and become, it can become a different sort of space and also the art becomes dematerialized i suppose maybe there's another word for uh by the architecture it becomes transformed mm -hmm. and then your your walking through actually interrupts that illusion and uh, it creates kind of an experience mm -hmm. but i think i'm not answering your no, question that's okay. great okay yeah so th that was something i was interested in since the food house floor piece mm -hmm. And you'll see there's, um, this is a photograph of the piece and a diagram. I like making the diagram. I actually make, anytime I, I make an installation, I will go to the space, um, make a 3D model and figure out, well, what can be done in the space. So I make a virtual kind of piece. So in, in this piece, uh, I had the, the Santa Monica Museum build wall strips out of uh, drywall, so it actually feels like half the wall's missing, and then there's a projector on the 
back of these strips hitting the back wall. And the animation kind of tilts a little bit and it makes the walls feel like they're moving. And I call this the TV room um, because when I was growing up, you had, there was one TV in a house and that was in a room <laughs> called the TV room. And I, it's also about the interlacing imagery. Can you talk to us about the sound that we're hearing? Oh, sure. Um, gosh. And how, how, and how you've collaborated I've, I've, in the past. Yeah. I've collaborated with uh, a few different musicians. Um, I'll tell them about the piece. I'll maybe give them quick time movies uh, so they can get an idea of what the piece is going to be like and um, hopefully actually have them in the space so they can under understand the acoustics of the space and also consider the meaning. And uh, when I collaborate, I always let them do whatever they want and it always turns out really great. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of a are miracle. you still interested in music? I mean, for in our exhibition, we don't have any um, examples. <laughs> um, I'm sure there will be an instance that comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't used music in a, in a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, here's one. With, another one with music. Mm -hmm. um, this was at their Fremont Street Experience in Las Vegas. It's still there. I don't know if they actually play it anymore. Um, they have an um, incredible sound system, actually. Uh, we went there and tested different kinds of um, soundtracks to see well, what it felt like and then um, how the audience responded, actually. How big is this? <laughs> well, it's 90 feet high. It's like six blocks long. It takes 10 minutes to walk across the entire thing. It's, it's gigantic. And it was, it was, there was a competition uh, in Las Vegas, a, sort of an arts, public art competition. And so I had to convince casino owners that, um, that this would be a good idea. And that, so I gave them a history of abstract animation, starting with um, Fantasia, Disney's Fantasia, or um, the uh, 2001, there's a 20 minute abstract film in the middle of the, the movie. I don't know if that actually helped, but. What was the reaction? Um, you know, people who were hanging out downtown Las Vegas, that must have been really exceptional mm -hmm. to, to witness that. Yeah, no, it was, it was kind of amazing because they would play it uh, once every hour. Mm -hmm. So everybody would leave the casinos and then come out to see whatever was playing. And you, you would think that would be a bad idea for Las Vegas, but so that was, it was very exciting. Well, I, yeah. I can just tell everyone that last night we met someone at the opening who saw the piece in oh. Las Vegas, so that's 18 years ago, and was oh, still was, was still impacted by um, by the experience. Mm. I thought that was amazing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, the scale is just, you, you can't even imagine the scale. It's so huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I got, um, I had to sort of, because of the curve, I had to do some experiments and see, well, what animation works on the curve and what doesn't. And some movement just dies, it's flattened out, and other, others ex become accentuated. So, um, and every time, so I flew, flew out there maybe seven times, and every time I did a test, it would be like $650 in electricity to turn on that thing. <laughs> it's crazy. I didn't have to pay though. happened and we were going to war with Afghanistan and I'm a pacifist and so I, I wanted to make a, a protest statement and so I, I made this this is the first piece using plants and um, I named it after Jimmy Carter because he was our probably our only president who was also a pacifist and um, I named it that because if at the time, if you protested the war or going to war, you would um, be considered a terrorist. And so I figure, well, if I name it after a president, then maybe I'm not a terrorist. So, <laughs> at any rate, uh, yeah, this kind of shifted everything for me. 
working with plants. And I thought of them as stripes. Um, and I mean, they do form stripes. And um, what's happening is a, a sort of curve that's full of flowers bends forward and then it knows that it has to go back home so it goes like this back. So there's software tools that kind of let you move it out and then other software tools that say, hey, come back. And, then, and so the flowers are kind of hanging on as they're getting you know, pulled back and forth. So I just, I found a really interesting review of this piece um, that was published in Art Forum and the critic wrote, this densely blooming wallpower is fluid and motion is everywhere. This isn't a fun room, it's a joy room. And if I could <clears throat> swing the deal, I would live in it. And so how would you respond to the idea of this as being joyful? Because to me, mm. it's really, that's, that's not what I see at all. Hmm. Well, huh. you, you know, I, I have, I guess I, I do want people to experience joy. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. And I, I guess I'm, I'm always appreciative when, when people say that. Great. Yeah. I think um, one thing I'm after is that I, I was, uh, the, the way I can explain it is when you go to the film, when you go to a movie, and you, you know, you're sitting through this movie and then you walk out of the theater, you feel transformed. Mm -hmm. You feel like everything, like the world looks a little bit different. That's what I'm after. Mm -hmm. That's, so if I can get that, I'm you know, thrilled. I don't know if I really get that, mm -hmm. but yeah, well, let's that's talk about the goal. That again with blind eye, because oh. I think, I think <laughs> oh, okay. it really works in, in that instance. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, this is at Caltech. It's kind of an art piece for scientists. So this is a photo. There's um, sensors along the ceiling that are kind of level with the piece, so up high. So as scientists walk through, they are triggering explosions. <laughs> was this also a war protest piece? It was, mm -hmm. yes. It was more um, a soft protest of funding for uh, science. Mm -hmm. So uh, at a an institution like Caltech, probably 70% of, of their funding comes from the war machine. I actually call, originally called this piece Retooling the War Machine, mm. and then I got a lot of pushback. So then I called it Einstein's Dilemma. Um, he actually wrote a lot about that problem. Who was pushing back the, the oh. site? Or? Well, it was a while ago. Uh, mostly the curator. He was, he had, um, He's from Art Center. It was a collaboration between Art Center and Caltech, mm -hmm. and I I think he felt like um, it, it would it would create too much animosity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's a photo, right? <laughs> this is incredible. Oh, it's not a photo. Oh, we can't tell here. So <laughs> sorry. Uh, this piece changed my life a little bit. Uh, it, was for, it was created for the Istanbul Biennial, and uh, Dan Cameron was the curator, and he said, you know, there's this cistern that has these Medusa heads, and I think your work would look nice there. And so I, you know, I went there, and this is, you walk through, has anybody been there? It's kind of amazing. It's, it's a, a tourist attraction. You walk through the cistern that's full of, um, uh, it's constructed with just found parts uh, from Greek and Roman ruins. And so part of that is these two Medusa heads, one's upside down and one's sideways. And it's probably to take away her power. So anyway, I, I researched Medusa and actually the, a lot of my work involves a lot of research, perhaps for inspiration or something. And um, I, that well, that's pretty amazing, the, the story and how she's been used over the years. And I thought I would create this enchanted environment for Medusa. And so the, one of the trees, which that one, uh, is kind of a dead tree that's come to life. And yeah. Can you, what were some of the technical difficulties in working in such a space? It must have been a really complicated oh, God. process. Um, well, there is <laughs> no way to get measurements. Uh, it was raining all the time inside, and there's water dripping down. Um, I just had to like cross my fingers. Mm. 
and there was one ladder for the whole show with like 200 people and I kind of had fights with people about getting the ladder. <laughs> so that was pretty difficult. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I'll, if you're an artist, always get your own ladder. <laughs> You can't, fly, still doesn't work, you can't fly with your own ladder. That must be too, oh, too difficult. Oh, but no, that's a main lesson from that. You, you no, it was a, a you know, it changed. Actually, um, my New York gallery, Lehman Maupin, discovered me there, and mm -hmm. um, they invited me, which is the next slide, mm -hmm. to um, create an exhibition. So this was November, and they said, uh, would you like to do a show in New York? And I hadn't shown in New York in a while, and I said, um, sure. And they well, we have an opening in January, so two months. And luckily I had seen um, a dervish performance and I thought, well, maybe trees could move like, try to try to move like dervishes. So that was the inspiration mm -hmm. for that piece. So Medusa snakes morphed to branches and then you land Right, oh yeah, trees. I didn't even explain that. Yeah, mm -hmm. the branches were moving like snakes. Mm -hmm. So now they're kind of, the trees are uh, trying to whirl like dervishes, mm -hmm. more or less. And then, that's a, that's a still. Okay. So this is an autobiographical piece yes. in some ways. Yes, it is, yeah. Um, it's, a pa it's my first panorama, and the piece up the hill is also a panorama. That means there's three projectors creating one long image, running in sync. And at any rate, um, this its sort of a funny story. I had made a piece called They Eat Their Wounded. And my mom said to me, wow, is that about your uncle? And, and I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, he was cannibalized. And I said, oh, really? And she said, yeah, there's a book. So my family, you know, they, usually you should know about that, I think. So, so I read the book. and. He actually wasn't cannibalized, but he was on, it was World War I, he was on a ship sailing out of Portland, Oregon, and it was, they were carrying uh, weapons, gasoline, ammunition, and uh, they were outside of Guam, they were struck by lightning. Uh, everybody had to get off the boat quickly, as you can imagine, it's very flammable materials. He was in a, um, in a boat that, in a, Rest of, what do you call it, lifeboat, that had too many sailors. They got caught in a current, and they were uh, stuck out there. And after 11 days, he drank seawater, and you're not supposed to do that. And so at any rate, um, he passed away, and they used his body for fuel and heat. And they created sort of a condenser to convert uh, seawater into tiny drops of fresh water. So he was 18, it's very sad. And so this is from his two points of view, one in the ocean and one he's in heaven. <laughs> I don't ask how I know that. <laughs> All right. I've heard you describe this as autobiographical. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I guess I was doing a lot of autobiographical pieces. Um, this, is, this is actually the, a photo from upstairs, upstairs, up the hill. Um, it's, the piece is called Rapunzel, and uh, it was using an algorithm that simulates, you know, hair. Because I was thinking, yeah, I want to do a, a self-portrait. And so I was playing around with that, and it seemed kind of boring to have projections of just hair. And then I noticed uh, going through the, op there's miles and miles of options in this software, it's called Maya. And there's one, you click the box, and you can add flowers to hair. I was like, oh, okay, let's try that. And then, so that looked pretty interesting. And then I ran across a cartoon that was uh, referencing Rapunzel. And I thought, oh, there's a hair thing. So I read uh, the story of Rapunzel. And then it, then it occurred to me, the story of Rapunzel actually parallels my story. So that you know, um, became a even more important. So in the story, in the beginning of Rapunzel, um, her mother is pregnant with Rapunzel and she has these intense cravings. Uh, did you have cravings for ramping? No, not, not. not for poisonous flowers, no. Well, at any rate, the, I don't think they're poisonous. They were used in salads a uh, hundred years ago. And um, so she had these intense cravings for um, rampion 
and that's where Rapunzel's name come from. And she happened to live next door to a witch. And I actually lived across the street from a witch, a whole house of witches. So there's funny coincidences in this. At any rate, um, so she gave up her daughter uh, for the Rampion, basically. And then the daughter lived in the tower and then grew her hair out and blah, blah, blah. So everybody knows that part of the story, not the beginning, whatever. And so. It also parallels the fact that my uh, parents were also alcoholics, and I feel like they gave up their children for an addiction as well. So that's how it's a self-portrait. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. It's a beautiful piece, and oh, thank people you. really responding to it up upstairs. Yeah. Oh, backwards. Uh -oh. There we go. So this was a really complicated project. Oh, my goodness. It's so another panorama. Uh, it, was in, it was created for the, um, oh, the Denver Art Museum and for their new edition, which was designed by Daniel Liebskin. And he, all the walls are slanted, which drives everybody crazy, but I loved. And I think it's, you know, they should only show installation art there, and then people can respond to the amazing you know, architectural inventions. And so, um, I was, it was, they asked me to do a piece before the building was even done, and I was thinking of different ideas, and I proposed something, and then um, the curator came back to me and said, you know, Daniel Liebskin doesn't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> and I was kind of amazing. So, architects, Al, uh, Stan, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I couldn't believe that happened. So at any rate, I couldn't do that idea, so I came up with this idea, which perhaps I like better anyways, so And where maybe. are the projectors in this piece? Um, they're, they're up in the ceiling, kind of pointing at an angle. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it, was really, it, it was a really crazy thing to calculate. I actually wasn't sure it was gonna work, so I mocked it up full scale, but I had the projector on its side, angling at a wall, because there is no way to, to mimic a, a 45 degree wall. Was, yeah. Can you just say a bit more about how you make these, how you measure before creating a piece? Or you're doing it on your computer. Um, well, uh, I have a laser measure and I, you know, I just model the whole room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it takes a few hours to model a space. And because then, if you notice, for instance, in our exhibition, your projections are perfectly aligned to yeah. our spaces. Thank so it's, goodness. It's, oh. but the, being precise is really important to your, mm -hmm. to your Oh, effect. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I'll usually I'll ask for measurements of a space, right, and, photo, and snapshots, and then I can kind of get an idea of how it's going to work. And then fortunately, I came out and um, re-measured, because that helped. Because mm -hmm. um, it's actually a really tight fit. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's possible that it wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. But thank goodness. No, it's actually the tolerance was like a couple inches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually it's safer. So, so this, uh, this piece was uh, a representation of the Rocky Mountains. So it's a, an invisible Rocky Mountain revealed by virtual cloth as it uh, falls. Oh, I could show you, I guess. There we go. I like how it sort of fell into, there's, there's a little reveal next to the floor. It felt like everything was just disappearing. It was really nice. Okay. So here your trees take on new meaning. Mm -hmm. you, this is when you begin to dedicate them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, or you done that before? I had, I began dedicating trees to uh, different teachers. Mm -hmm. And the first one was for Miss Zanerald, which none of you probably know. She was my teacher in Edina, Minnesota. Uh, she was my first grade teacher, and she said to me in front of the whole class, you made the best tree. And I thought, wow. <laughs> they don't do that anymore, which is too bad, maybe. <laughs> 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 so, 
So, um, so, after, so I made a series of trees for Miss Zanerald, and then I also made um, a series of trees for Mike Kelly, who was also my teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hammer Museum was having a gala, or gala as people say here, and um, asked me to do something uh, for, for the event, and they were honoring Mike, and I thought, well, I can make trees for Mike, mm -hmm. and he actually, appreciated them. And this is actually in North Adams. So some of you may have seen that tree too. I actually didn't get to see it there. It's, it's too bad. It's such an incredible space. People here are still talking about it. Oh my goodness. Um, is there anything you can tell us about Mike Kelly as a teacher? Um, sure. He didn't say much, mm -hmm. but whenever he said something, you would remember. It would stick. It was it, it, very impactful. Mm -hmm. And he seemed very critical. Mm -hmm. Yet, well, he was also very supportive. And um, I think that's really an important quality for a teacher to balance criticality and, and support. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another eye. This is at the Getty. Let's play the video. Um, so I, it seems to be a reoccurring theme. <laughs> in my work to, to make eyes and didn't quite realize that, I suppose, mm -hmm. until I made blind eye for the Clark. And this was um, an oculus at the Getty Center. Um, they asked me, can you make something for this? And so I had about a year, so I researched the Getty and their, get, their also their museum in Malibu, and uh, which the, the Malibu Museum is a reconstruction of the Villa de Papri, which was covered by uh, volcanic uh, pyro pyroclastic flow from uh, Mount Vesuvius. And so I thought, well, I'll make the eye um, with pyroclastic flow. And it, it kind of looks like an iris. And it's actually inspired by the fact that um, an oculus, it means eye. And um, I had been to, uh, to Rome, to the, to the oh, oh no. Uh, the Pantheon. The Pantheon, thank you. Mm -hmm. And it was raining that day, and it looked like the eye was, that the, the oculus was crying, and that sort of stuck with me. Mm -hmm. So I think that inspired this piece. And I also thought of it as an eye of God, so it's a left eye of God. And So this is different than the other works you've been showing us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a, it, it's a drawing. This is the only piece where I actually draw, uh, drew something mm -hmm. with, I actually used a Sharpie pen, paper, and then scanned it into the computer and then animated it. So everything else, so I sort of broke my rule. I, was, I said, everything is going to be done in the computer, <laughs> so, which was true until this piece. And I haven't done, it, I haven't done anything like that since, I don't think. No. You should always break your rules. And um, the ceiling is a little bit strange in this space. It actually slants down in the back, so. Oh, and Polly was in that show. <laughs> okay, and this is called Orbit. It's kind of a science fiction piece. It's a planet that orbits through a whole year in, a, in about three and a half minutes. So this is, an instance when you're really, you know, well, your work has been described as hypersurface architecture, and I think that's really, oh, yeah. yes, and I think this is a really interesting example, but I was asking you about how meticulously you install your pieces. How do you deal with the X factors of being outdoors? I mean, are there mm -hmm. certain things that arise, complications? Well, actually, the museum took care of all of that mm -hmm. um, because they actually create, they decided this surface is going to be an, an exhibition space. Mm -hmm. So they ha also had other artists. Um, but uh, they used enclosures and their neighbors, the Pulitzer Foundation across the street said, yes, you can put projectors up on our, on our property. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a really nice opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a, it's two projectors to fill that space. And this is a public arts piece in Los Angeles uh, along the Walk of Fame on Vine Street. And so 
the developer, you know, they pretty much say, well, they had these columns that the architecture that the architect designed, and they wanted me to do something with the columns, and I looked at all the stars along our section of the Walk of Fame, and one of them was Orson Welles, who I, I you know he's an amazing filmmaker, and you know, I was thinking, okay, well, he made Citizen Kane, and it's about a flower in a funny way. And so I, I thought, you know, Rosebud, of course. And so it, it got me thinking, well, what are the other flowers in this film? And then uh, what about all the other stars along here? And so we researched all these films looking for flowers and looking for flowers that had something to do with the plot. And then basically remade the films using the flowers that were in the films. And uh, it, it became sort of a dedication to the, the set decorators. So I'm interested in your proximity to the film industry, being in LA and working mm -hmm. in a kind of adjacent um, medium. Where do you see the points of kind of intersection? Or I mean, I know you quite literally have collaborated with filmmakers, your opera, your tenor. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yeah, that didn't get made, but oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, no, I had a chance to work with Bill Friedkin, who um, created the, the scariest film ever made, The Exorcist. And he was really, really an amazing person to work with. But then I think it was going over budget mm -hmm. and, or something, who knows. Mm -hmm. So it's a shame, because yeah, I would have, I I would have made uh, some animations for uh, Venus's Kate, for Townhauser's transition he was in love with Venus, and then he became in love with a human, and so it was the transition between the two. And so apparently I'm in between. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, this one's another oh. selfie. Mm -hmm. Another <laughs> self-portrait. And this, this is up the hill as well. It's mm -hmm. called Premature. And I guess, hmm. How is this autobiographical in some ways, loosely? Well. I, um, I was having uh, numbness in my leg, you know, and uh, so I ended, nobody could figure it out. So um, I went to a, a neurologist and she was like, a, she must have watched Dr. House or something. And she like did every test under the sun and figured out, oh, I have something called MGUS. And then of course that freaked me out and I made an art piece about it. So it, it just means I get a blood test every six months and hopefully I don't have anything except for an extra protein, which is annoying. But you are channeling veins and kind of the, mm -hmm. the innards here. I mean, something yeah. that I, one of the reasons I was so drawn to this piece for our show is that it has a kind of sculptural quality. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, it's very much a standout, I think, upstairs. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I love how it becomes this, this sculpture mm -hmm. rather than filling the walls. Mm -hmm. And it, does, it doesn't dematerialize in the same way. It becomes an object. Whereas the other pieces that fill the walls are more subjective. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the animation, good. <laughs> well, uh, I was invited to create a piece for this space. So it's usually, I always make a piece in response to an invitation. And this was an old baggage terminal in San Diego, mm -hmm. uh, converted into a museum, the museum, um, Museum of Contemporary Art. They said, uh, they, what would you like to do here? <laughs> it's, a, it's a giant space. And um, I, every time you draw, I drive from Los Angeles to San Diego, exactly halfway in between is a nuclear power plant. And it, it was the most frightening thing. It's, it's right on the ocean. Uh, it looks you know, like it's falling apart. Luckily, they've actually closed it now but who knows what they're gonna do with all this stuff. At any rate, um, so I started researching nuclear power and nuclear weapons and how they relate. And there's actually some um, amazing, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, ad, not advocate, <laughs> the opposite. Anyway, Helen Caldicott, and she really inspired me to, to think about this relationship. And, um, I was reading and watching films and kept kind of coming across um, Madame Curie. And so I got diverted and uh, read her autobiographies and 
uh, one of her uh, one of her daughters wrote uh, this really great autobiography, and throughout the book she mentions flowers, um, the, f the flowers that Marie Curie uh, purchased. She would cut cut she would purchase cut flowers when she was a, a starving student, the first female student at the Sorbonne in Paris, and. Um, she had foundations. There was just this mention of her love of botany throughout this book. And of course, I'm the only person on earth who would read her book focusing on the flowers rather than, you know, uh, she discovered two elements which nobody knew about. I mean, that's, that's just, you know, insane. Uh, radium and polinium. So she was an amazing scientist. So this piece became, it sort of took my negative fear and converted it into, um, an homage to an amazing scientist and somebody who, I don't know how she did it. How many types I mean, of women flowers? women weren't allowed out of the house barely. How many types of flowers do you have? I mean, there seems to be so oh. many layers and textures here. I, I actually don't remember, maybe um, something like 70, maybe. Mm. No, that's not right. That was from my other piece. A lot. We'll have to look, you have to look on my website. Mm -hmm. There's a list. <laughs> <laughs> or read the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so this is two panoramas, three projections, and then one in the middle. Let's see. And then I love this piece. It's <laughs> just it's so different than, than mm -hmm. your other your other work. Yeah, it's sort of less serious. Mm -hmm. Although it really, it, but it it really is serious. Um, it's very big, literal. Mm, well, you know, I love literal actually. Mm -hmm. I I think um, one of my favorite you know, probably. Kill me. Um, oh no, now I'm forgetting. That's good. Maybe it's good. My brain stops, edits me from saying things. I've I I heard you talk about this as jewelry for architecture. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, this was this was created for a fundraiser um, for AIDS at CAA, which is uh, where actors are. Uh, you know. Uh, why am I blanking yeah, so much? Celebrities, actors, it's a, it's a talent. Uh, yeah, agency. talent agency, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And so uh, I installed it. So if you go there, all the women wear these amazing shoes that are you know, ext extraordinary. And I thought, wow, this, this place has this sort of vibe. So I, I thought it needed jewelry. So, so uh, yeah, I need to make more jewelry for architecture. I think mm -hmm. it, it's fun. And it's sort of, you know, I don't know, architecture seems, it needs, it needs, it needs something like that. Yeah. So here's some more. <laughs> um, another Dan Cameron biennial, this, um, oh, actually, oops, uh-oh, go backwards, thank you. Uh, this is the, on the left, it's at the New Orleans uh, Museum of Art, and uh, there's a, a Rodin sculpture in front of this uh, portal. And I asked them if they could move it and because I thought it'd be a great place to project. And then that led me to, oh, maybe I should think about Rodin. So I researched him and I decided, you know, I'm gonna make a piece in honor of Rodin from his, his point of view. Mm. So. It's kind of incredible, incredible to be able to project in, in a space with so much light. Mm -hmm. And that's happening more and more. Actually, this, this piece is called Moth. It, it's, a, it's meant to be projected in a lit space. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the video is so difficult. Vi the video is a little bit, it looks too dark. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, um, this was done for the fabric workshop in <laughs> Philadelphia, which is run by Kippy Stroud, and she, um, we were at a party, and I was trying to think, well, what am I gonna make for the fabric workshop, you know? And there was a little moth flying around, and she went and killed it. <laughs> and I thought, I, I said, why did you kill that moth? And she, they eat fabric, and I was like, oh, okay. And I thought, okay, so I made this piece where it's about a little moth eating fabric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This piece was originally made for Spain, and it's, um, I had seen a Stephen Hawking uh, 
documentary about how about cosmology, about how life came to be on Earth, and it felt so random, and you know, and actually, religion feels so strange to me. Like it doesn't really like explain. I don't. I don't. I don't get either point of view actually. So I thought, well, I'm going to make so. Stephen Hawking's description of how life came to be is an asteroid breaks through the planet's uh, atmosphere, melts, and then the microbes from the asteroid form life on a planet. And it's called panspermia. And so I decided, okay, I'm gonna make asteroids that have paintings and drawings and etchings on them. And then those are the asteroids that start life. So. Uh, I'll have to figure out a name for this religion. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess it could be called panspermia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, at any rate, um, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts had this dome, and um, my parents actually lived in Minneapolis, and so when I go there, I'm really thinking about them and, you know, like all the whatever stress. And we were up there looking at this blank dome. I think it had maybe clouds painted on it. And I go, oh, asteroids. Like, I knew instantly, so. Well, space does seem to be a recurring theme as well, along with your mm. snakes and Yeah, branches. it started, yeah, the first mm -hmm. piece had mm -hmm. planets. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. And this is um, a tree for my color teacher, Judy Crook. Amazing inspiration for me. Let me ask you a question I heard someone ask yesterday because I think it will come mm. up. How true to life are these trees supposed to be? Is this a mm. real specimen or? Mm -mm. <laughs> okay, can you talk a little bit no. about that? I think it's really interesting. Um, it's, well, it's probably a, it's maybe a, a dumb reason, but whatever. Uh, the trees are, except for the trees here, mm -hmm. um, are not based on real trees. And it's because there's a limitation to the software. Mm -hmm. So my, all my trees, except for the birches and blind eye, are kind of imaginary trees. Mm -hmm. um, all the flowers are actually quite based on, you know, they're more realistic. Mm -hmm. Also, I wanted this to be about color. Mm -hmm. And so the, the tree has sort of a skin color. Oh, yes. This is a public art piece as for a courthouse um, in Long Beach, California. And I got to convince a judge that I should be able to make a piece for her. I had actually had another public art piece, which got, um, it, it was in full on progress, and the judge decided that there was something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And he thought I was not trustworthy. And he thought I was always trying, you know, trying to pull something over. And he was also afraid of trees. <laughs> and so, so that piece got canceled. And then I was invited to do another courthouse. And I'm like, oh gosh, this is. <laughs> so I actually really thought about it, and um, it led me to investigating intuition and thinking about how artists, you know, or people throw around that word and nobody really knows exactly what that means. And what I figured out is intuition is about decision making. It's, it's fast thinking, it's knowing, it's make, it, as an artist works, they're making thousands of very fast decisions about, you know, where does this line go? What is this, this, this color, blah, 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 you know? And it, artists become very good at intuit, intuitive knowing and decision making. So it's really decision making. And so I, I explained that to this judge and said, you know, we have a lot in common. You're working with decisions and I'm working with decisions. And so that seemed to make sense. Mm. And that led to this piece which um, I researched um, the goddess of justice. And the first one uh, was named I'm, I never know how to pronounce it. I'm just going to say Matt. And she wore a feather in her hat. And when you die, she takes your soul and weighs it against this feather. And if it doesn't weigh the same, if it's more or less, you go to hell. So 
Did you take into account the kind of mental space of the types of people who would be oh. inhabiting? Um, the oh, absolutely. Thing? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it needed to be a piece that didn't really disturb people because, mm -hmm. I mean, your whole life is mm -hmm. hanging on the balance when you go into a courthouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really important to me. And this this material, it's um, an LED mesh that's woven into a giant stainless steel mesh, which covers that entire area. And so the LEDs are illuminated to, sh to form the image. And what I liked about the material, and I always wanted to work with it, is uh, it's transparent, so you can see through it. And actually, when you work with light, um, black is transparent, so you can see that there. So I'm always working with transparency in some way. That's here. <laughs> it's called Diaspora, and this is upstairs. Upst mm -hmm. You guys have put stairs in. <laughs> it's like ridiculous. <laughs> it's up. Um, I made this for Hong Kong, for Lehman Maupin at Hong Kong, and uh, I thought about diaspora, and plants, there's a term for plants called diaspora, it's where um, break, plants break apart and spread their seeds. And it was funny when I got to Hong Kong and looked around, you know, I hadn't been there, uh, there's no diaspora there. So that was quite it's revealing. So clean and yeah, clean. it's very clean. Because um, you kind of notice, like if I'm working on a piece, if I'm working on this piece, I'll notice all the stuff on the ground. I'll be sort of focused on it. Or if I'm working on flowers, I'll, I'll you know, stop and look at every flower. So, luckily, there's not a lot of birch trees in Los Angeles, so that's a good thing. <laughs> like, yes, and they look sad actually. They're very happy here. Okay, this is a major oh. public art piece. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was invited to do Times Square. Um, this is a lot of screens. I think I wrote down the amount, like mm -hmm. 63 or something. Mm. And that was fun. I had a piece that I had made uh, for the Stanford Hospital called Botanic. And I, I sort of retooled that uh, for New York. Um, I used condolence flowers, thinking, uh, thinking about 9-11 a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what was the reaction of people in the street? Did, were you oh. noticing people well, stopping and looking? There's so there's much some happening. some people here with, who experienced mm -hmm. that. Um, there was people stopped and honked, mm -hmm. which I was a little surprised. It's, it was, it's incredible. I mean, you can't imagine the amount of light. Mm -hmm. And then when all the screens are all of a sudden filled with artwork rather than advertising, it's, Amazing. you know, it, it changes everything, yeah. I wish we could, they could do all the screens. So you need to talk to Dunkin' Donuts. They will. They never give up their screen. So, of course, I won't eat there. Yeah, okay. So this is a little bit. This is the piece from Stanford, just to show you. I, um, a lot of my work has been in hospitals. Um, it doesn't cure anything. <laughs> I think it makes people feel good. Well, it's back to what you said in the very beginning, that that's a wonderful thing you can offer mm -hmm. your viewer. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how that actually works. Mm. <laughs> it's a mystery. So they, they kind of crash. So, yeah, it's sort of surprising the hospital wanted this piece where the plants break apart, but they did. And they wanted more violence. So mm. it was, Okay, this, uh, this I, I created f um, for Rhizome. It was shown at the New Museum in a conference called Seven on Seven. And it's, they uh, put artists together with um, scientists, et cetera, uh, to create an artwork for the conference. And um, I was put together, I'm gonna screw up her name. Oh, at any rate. We didn't really collaborate too much, so maybe I don't have to say. <laughs> I used her software, though. It's called Affectiva. And what it does, it uh, captures your, your facial expression, which then you can consider an emotion, 
like if you're smiling or if you're sad or if you're frowning, and then um, that it takes that information and you can utilize it. So I created a sort of mask that grabs your face and then that the mask is sort of responding to you. And because it was for the conference, I used the back camera on the tablet so the audience would also be in the piece. And they were sort of warped onto a sphere and turned black and white. Oh. <laughs> it's one of my assistants. She's, I was surprised at how expressive she was. <laughs> um, this is called Still Life. Um, I've always loved uh, still life painting and I thought I really want to make something mm -hmm. about that and trying to capture that kind of lighting. And then the, the fruits kind of squish and they're con contained in this uh, box area. Mm -hmm. And this is a double projection. Then I made another piece. Uh, it was originally made for a stem cell research group at USC, and they wanted me to look at all the research they're doing uh, with stem cells and come up with a piece for their lobby. And um, it was amazing to, to learn about stem cells and, and the future and, you know, how it's going to change everything for us medically and how they actually, uh, just a few years ago, um, reversed, or, or they can take skin cells now and reverse them so they can be pluripotent cells, which means they can be used. They don't have to use aborted babies or, <laughs> and, you know, which is really, thank God, I suppose. At any rate, um, so there's, it's just an amazing thing to research. So I, I became inspired by the fact that fruit are actually the ovaries of plants. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to make this this piece uh, called ovaries for a, for their stem cell. And then this was also shown again in in Spain. This is winter fountains. Most recently. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is when we first met, and you were very busy. Oh. As um, and this oh was an God. incredibly incredibly complicated project mm -hmm. um, outdoors in a kind of format that you I've never worked in before. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, they, a couple years ago, they invited me to create a, an, an, a night art piece for the Franklin Parkway, which um, it's about a mile long and has all the cultural, a lot of the cultural institutions in Philadelphia. And so I actually didn't really realize it, but they were all my client. So there was a lot of pressure that somehow I, compartmentalized out of my brain. And I mean, there was enough pressure thinking, okay, what can I do in, you know, to light up this parkway at night with you know, a certain amount of budget? And I had been thinking about domes for another piece and I thought, okay, I can position giant domes and project on them. And, it, and this was made for the winter, so it occurred to me the fountains are turned off during the winter, and so I could, I could make something that would replace them. And I was actually thinking I could cover one of the fountains, which was a totally insane idea. So, but, <laughs> but it, it's just scale-wise, and maybe logistically, that would be sort of a bad idea. So anyway, we figured out where we could position these, and uh, we'd use four projectors on 14-foot poles with enclosures. Um, placed around each dome. There's four of them uh, placed along the parkway. And you can see one from another to another. And um, I had to come up with an idea and I had to uh, appease all my clients, mm -hmm. a couple science museums, an art, an, um, an art school, three art museums, a couple churches, uh, a horticultural society. Um, and, you know, I looked through all their collections and was thinking about this and, I mean, they had amazing, amazing things, artifacts, dinosaurs and things. And um, I thought, well, you know, this parkway is named after Benjamin Franklin. So I, 
and I've you know, researched scientists before, and uh, he's incredible. He's, he, in his one life, he had the life of about 20 people. He did so many things, and he's one of our greatest scientists, and he discovered that static electricity is the same thing as lightning. And uh, in this enlightenment period, people thought, oh, lightning was something God did, you know, to maybe punish people or something. So they really didn't associate electricity and static elect or electricity and um, lightning. So I, I researched, well, how is lightning formed in clouds? And its tiny particles bash into each other and form static electricity and forms, you know, uh, lightning. So that it's kind of what these, oh, oh, it's the end, I see. <laughs> it's kind of what the piece is about then, is the formation of electricity. So I wanted the lightning in the piece to be like drawings. Can I ask you about the afterlife of your work? Because I think this is an mm -hmm. interesting well. example, um, <laughs> if you want to talk about it. But They're in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> that means in a, in a warehouse somewhere, maybe. But just mm. uh, just in more in more broader strokes, um, is this something you think of, about and take into account? Um, you know, when your work comes down, it's not like a sculpture; it it's it's a file. And so, mm -hmm. how important or how active are you in kind of greater conversations about conservation of mm. digital um, art and preservation and et cetera? Um, when I make a piece, I I render it double at least double what the resolution of the current uh, device, projection device is, or whatever. Um, and then that, those files, they're just picture image files from the animation can be migrated to uh, maybe a higher resolution. But, uh, and maybe about 15 years ago, I re-rendered everything I had made mm -hmm. to a higher res. And I'm actually, now that everything's 4K and it very quickly is going to be 8K. <laughs> I'm going to have to do it again. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just constantly keeping up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really nice to have 4K now because I, my video documentation, if you hadn't noticed, has gotten a lot nicer. It's because mm -hmm. the technology is a lot better. So this, this tree is um, a spin off of the piece up the hill. It's a um, couple of the trees from this piece, Blind Eye. So um, I was very inspired by the space and its location in a forest, although I didn't get to see it green until a couple days ago. That's right, this is the first time you've been here without snow on the ground. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, yeah I came here in May and there was snow, for heaven's sake. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, it happens. Yeah. But you spend a lot of time not only in the, our, our, the, the gallery and um, kind of experiencing mm -hmm. the architecture, but I know that we sent you a lot of research about mm -hmm. our, our land, the types of animals that oh, inhabit yeah. it, the types mm -hmm. of the trees, the trees and, yep. and that was very important to you as you oh, started absolutely. thinking about the piece. Yep. Oh, and the collection, mm -hmm. looking at like uh, the birch trees in your collection and mm -hmm. thinking about that. And, yep, so um, it was... But I, I think it was this wall, though, that kind of formed, it, it needed an image that didn't have perspective, or it had implied perspective. So the layering, uh, it's like when you, if you cover up an eye, or if you have one eye, the way you see is without the dimensionality. And so this piece is kind of about monocular, monocular vision. And then the fact that birch trees have single eyes, mm -hmm multiple single eyes, it, it kind of made sense. And it's also playing on the word blind. I think for me, one of the most incredible um, parts of this piece is the layering and the perspective, mm -hmm. and then also the experience in the space where you are confronted by the image, the panorama, and then you have the window next to you with the mm. reflection. And so it's this kind yeah. of infinite forest, mm -hmm. real and imagined, and it's so powerful. It's, it's mm -hmm. incredible. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is, just recently, the projectors have been bright enough so you can actually have windows in the mm -hmm. space, mm -hmm. and you, uh, you guys were gracious enough to tint the windows so that the, we could have you know, the, uh, the architecture part of the piece more. 
So Jennifer, I want to thank you so much for oh. um, walking through your career with us and mm -hmm. especially for your work and for allowing us to live with it for the next few months and mm -hmm. especially for Blind Eye, which I know is a really um, a big, a big challenge yeah. and a task and it's more I, trees than I've ever made <laughs> and it's um, and it's time. incredible it's I think it's a complete success and we are so honored to oh, to have you. it here at the Clark and so with that I want to thank you and I, I think we'd like to open it up to a for a question or two piece accompanying it, that the text says that it, your inspiration came from a nightmare while you were doing some of these installations. Okay. Oh, I can speak I forget, to I can I speak forgot. to that because um, my department oh. wrote the label. But Jennifer came oh into the into this space one day and she said, "I because we didn't That's have right. a we didn't oh, have a title right. for the show right. or for the piece." And Jennifer oh, said, "Eureka! I, I figured it out. I had a nightmare last night, and it was about an eye." But really, I'm not surprised it was about an eye because that has been a recurring theme throughout your, your entire body Oh, now work. I can't remember the nightmare. I remember it, but maybe oh, you don't want me to share I it. I probably emailed it to you. You told oh. me. It was disturbing, but... Oh, um, God. <laughs> oh, now I remember it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, serial killer Xing out your eyes. It's, yeah, pretty bad. We were working That's her right. too hard, and she um, it, it, it seeped <laughs> into her, to her psyche. <laughs> Thanks for the, uh, the presentation. Um, I was curious about uh, the play of the, the viewer's shadow in your piece. Like if you have mm -hmm. a projection, uh, sometimes it seems like the viewer's shadow can sort of become part of the piece and sometimes that can break the illusion. And I was wondering mm -hmm. how you felt about that. Sure. Um, I used to place the projectors low so that you really interrupted the piece. Um, that became sort of a problem because people would mess around with the projectors. Um, so I've, you, you still get that effect, but you have to walk a little closer to the screen. So I think that's important that you become part of the artwork by disrupting it. What do you do to take into account the substrate that you're <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, it usually needs to be a matte finish, otherwise you get a highlight from the projection. Um, and it works better if it's a white surface, otherwise, because um, it brings out the white in the image. It, um, sometimes, you know, it's, you just cistern. have to try it. Like yeah. In Istanbul, I mean, you couldn't control. Oh, the cistern, yeah, that was, yeah, that was part of the, the worry, how dark the surface was in the cistern. But it, it worked out nicely. It was, yeah. I have these small pieces and at Green Grassy in London, we projected them onto a brick wall and it actually looked magical. So, never Well, know. maybe we'll invite you back to project on the exterior of our, our campus. <laughs> we'll give you a oh, break okay. for a few months. Um, but I want to thank you, Jennifer, for being here with us today. And I invite you to um, join me, come up the hill, um, and to enjoy the exhibition. So thank you so much. Thank you.